A few years ago, a buddy of mine were having dinner in his, his hometown of Baltimore, and we were celebrating his ordination, and so we were at this really swanky place and had an amazing meal. But as we came out, a gentleman came up to us and asked us for, for any change or money that we could spare. Now, this part of Baltimore, it was, it's, it's the really nice section of Baltimore. And usually you're not going there if you don't have some means to be able to, to buy something there. But the problem is, I don't really carry cash with me, and neither did my friend. And we tell that to this, to this man, and, and he just kind of nudges at the wonderful steakhouse we just came out of, like, come on, buddy. Come on. And he asked for money again. And, and so I decided I was just going to give him every bit of cash I had on me, which was not that great of a sacrifice because it was literally just pocket change. And so I see his cup and I say, hey, you know, I know it's not much, but I hope this helps, man. And, and God bless. Now, there are some people I know who, who, when they're in a situation like that, they may be able to proclaim some amazing blessing like, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, I give to you. That, that, that's never been me. I don't know this person. And, you know, I'm not engaging in a conversation about faith. A lot of times the best that I can kind of offer up is this sort of sheepish God bless. And so that's what I say. I was like, man, I know it's not much, but this is what I have. And God bless And I put it in his cup, and immediately, this man was angry with me. And it might have been because I said, God bless, and then gave him just pocket change. Or it might have been the fact that it was probably maybe 37 cents. But if I were a betting man, I'd say it's because that cup was not a cup meant for change. But was instead a soda he had just bought for himself. And I had dumped my dirty pocket change inside it. Now, in my defense, he was a good deal taller than me. And the cup was well above where I could see. But even still, I put that money in his cup and immediately he's angry and he starts dumping the soda out of his hand, trying to get the money out. And he says, oh, man, why'd you have to go and do that? Like I did it to be mean. And then he said, you got to give me more now. And I just kept apologizing. I'm like, no, no, seriously, I'm so sorry. That's all the cash that I have. And I just kept apologizing as my friend and I slowly walked away. And I realized I don't think I helped that man that much. In fact, he was worse off after that encounter than he had been before. You know, it, it can be tricky trying to help people sometimes. You know, often we'll come up with all kinds of reasons not to do it. But the thing is, for the person of faith, helping people, serving, that's, that's pretty much one of the core requirements. We see that as we continue today in our uh, series we're doing on the book of James. Last week we talked about being uh, not just uh, hearers of the word, but doers and the ways that we need to be able to take the time to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, because anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Today, What we're talking about is how in order for faith to be real, it's got to move. It has to be accompanied by some actions. Our reading is coming from the second chapter of James. If you would like to follow along, there is an insert in your bulletin. But as we come to God's word now, let us come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this word. We thank you, God, that that you use your word to speak to us, Lord, that, that we may have guidance, that we may know how we are to live our lives, that we may know how to please you. We pray, God, that your spirit now will let these words not just be words on a page, but that let them become life to us. Help us to hear you, God. Help us to see. Help us to love more. Lord, at this time, I ask that anything I say that is not from you or does not conform to your word, God, let that just fall away. But let everything from you be planted in the good soil of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beginning at verse 1, James writes, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, 
Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing? What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? And here ends our reading. James doesn't mess around, right? As we said, like, oh, man, he may, and we never will know, but James may have just been that brash and that in your face, no matter the context. But to help us understand a little bit of what's going on here, it's good for us to look at the context of the passage and to know a little bit more about James. This James is traditionally held to be the man known as James the Just, also known as James the brother of Jesus. And now James, he was not one of the 12 disciples, but he became a leader in the early church after Jesus' resurrection. And it's believed that he's writing this letter to a group of Jewish Christians, groups, you know, folks who had been Jewish, but now followed after Jesus, who were driven out of Jerusalem based on persecution and have resettled in Syria. But whether they were in Jerusalem or Syria, that entire region was still tremendously influenced by Greek culture. When Philip and Alexander, later his son Alexander the Great, conquered all of the known world, they didn't just conquer with the military, they conquered with their culture. And that culture influenced ideas and thought and ways of life to the point that at this time, even though Rome was the person in power and Greece no longer was, the main language of the day, the language everyone would know, was Greek. Now, even though Greece had been so diligent to export their culture to all the places they had conquered, there were certain, pre certain people groups who really tried to hold on to their native culture. And the Jewish people were one of those groups. The Jewish people were accustomed to being different, to having to fight to maintain their unique identity as the people of God, separate from the rest of the culture and the rest of the world. And the same held true for the early church. The early church would proclaim to be in the world, but not of the world. But of course, it can be so hard to live among a culture and to be a part of it and that you are surrounded by it, but to keep your faith distinct from that culture, particularly when there are certain aspects of that culture that are contrary to your faith. So to help you understand a little bit about Greek culture and what might be going on here, I want to do just a little word study. In ancient Greek, the word that meant good was the Greek word kalos. The word that meant beautiful was also kalos. The same word that meant good meant beautiful. But kalos also had a lot of other meanings. It could also be translated as praiseworthy, precious, useful, commendable, admirable, honorable, noble. All of those things in this one word, kalos. Now think about what that means. That means that in the Greek mind, they genuinely could not even conceive of someone who was beautiful, but was not good. That would be like saying the beautiful was not beautiful or the good was not good. They are the same word. 
And likewise, they had, would have difficulty conceiving of someone who was ugly or poor or, or pitiable or any of the things that are contrary to Kalos. They could not conceive of a person like that also being good or noble or praiseworthy or virtuous. And what that did was that led to a society that prioritized aesthetics, as we know, beauty, goodness, and virtue. And they associated a lot of those things with influence, power, and wealth. The Greek culture was one that catered to the wealthy because the wealthy were kalos, good. But the Hebrew culture, on the other hand, was absolutely not that way. That's not at all how that language works. And eventually, the people in the, the Hebrew nation, they would interact, of course, with this Greek culture. So how do you hold on to that difference? I mean, the Hebrew people, think about the main story that had defined them throughout their history. It's the story of the Exodus. The story of God liberating these people after 400 years of bondage and slavery in Egypt. And their God forever became identified as the God who liberates from slavery. The God who rescues. The God who sent a very clear and distinct message to all the rich and the powerful and the ones who would use their means to persecute and oppress. God sent the message through the Exodus, your time is up. You are on notice. Because the Lord is a God of justice, a God who does not show partiality to the rich over the poor, but rather a God who has chosen to bless and to work through those who are humble for his own glory and thus shame those who are esteemed in the eyes of the world. And we see that trend continue in Jesus when God took on flesh and became Emmanuel, God with us. Because Jesus came, and even though Jesus was God and was worthy of every bit of adoration and praise, what did Jesus do? Jesus went to the margins, to the poor, the downtrodden, and the outcast, and he lived among them. Jesus was a menial laborer, manual laborer, and did menial work, and he provided the example for all of us of what it means, what it means to live a life of love and sacrifice as he paid the ultimate price for us by dying on the cross for our sins. And so this community that James is writing to, they are the heirs of that history. They were Jews who followed the Messiah, Jesus. And then here again now, knowing all of this, what does James say to them? He says, I hear that at your meetings, you are showing partiality to the rich and prejudice to the poor. Do you you hear a little bit more what he's doing here? He's saying, you have given in to the surrounding Greek culture. He tells them that so clearly, how can you have faith in Jesus? You know, your poor and suffering Messiah who came to flip the expectations of the world on its head. That guy, how can you claim to have faith in him and then choose to act exactly like the rest of the world by showing such prejudice against the poor? And such favor to the rich as you effectively lay out the red carpet for them. And then he reminds them, these, the rich, they're the very ones who are persecuting you. The very ones who are causing you to suffer because you bear the noble name of Jesus. The Kalos, noble name of Jesus. Have you forgotten, he's essentially asking, who our God is and how our God works? That's, that's a, that's a, gosh, that's a hard message. I mean, I don't know how it was received originally, but I imagine, you know, there's a little bit of tucking the tail between their legs and feeling ashamed and everything else. It's a hard message then, and it can be a hard one now because the history of our church is a very interesting one. And I mean the the church, not just second church here, because think about the church originally, it started off poor and then it was persecuted. And then over time it grew to such an extent that it was then tolerated. Then the church wasn't just tolerated by the Roman Empire, it became the religion of the Roman Empire. And then it grew even larger than any empire or state, and the church dictated pretty much everything as the power broker of Europe. And we've had reforms and breakaways since that time, but that is now the history of the Christian church coming from a place of privilege. We used to be the ones who shaped culture. 
as Christendom was the law, the land, but that's not the way it is anymore. The church isn't shaping the culture like it once did. The church is not the standard bearer of society. And right now, in this generation, we have to come to terms with the fact that the church is not given this automatic position of respect and prominence anymore. And it can be so easy, so easy to to want the church to still have that place of prominence in our communities and respect in our communities the way it did under Christendom. And we may think, gosh, man, if we could just do things the way we did 30 years ago, 40 years ago, that would do it. That would change everything. That would, that would bring them back. And so we curry to the powerful and the rich longing for their influence to help us. And we relax our beliefs and our standards in order to do so. And in that, we likely find ourselves guilty of the same sin as James's original audience. Because it's so easy. It may even, in fact, be human nature to show such deference to the rich while ignoring or even denigrating the poor. But but as the church, as the followers of Jesus, we have to choose with whom are we going to align ourselves Because it may feel good, it may even feel natural to align ourselves with the values of the world because we're so steeped in it and we don't see the distinction between the call of faith and the call of culture and society. You see, we as the church, we've been at the center of society for so long that it may be the only way we know how to function. And we don't know exactly how to reach out to the margins, to the marginalized, the oppressed, the poor, the very ones that when Jesus was on earth, he spent all of his time with. But we have to be careful that we have not lived in in the center, unchallenged and complacent for so long that we no longer heed the call of Jesus to go to the margins, to the poor and the downtrodden, so that we may take up their cause as our own, so that we may assist not out of condescension or power, but out of a mutual shared dignity because we are all the image bearers of our God. The last pagan emperor of Rome was a man named Julian. And he came into power in 361. 50 years prior to this, Constantine had issued what's called the Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan was in a document that officially proclaimed religious tolerance for Christianity. And even though it had been 50 years and there had been all sorts of councils since then, Julian, when he came to power, he decided he wanted to reverse that. He thought the problem with the Roman Empire was it needed to go back to Roman ways. And so he began to try to reverse the Edict of Milan. He wanted to marginalize and oppress Christians again. But the church, no matter what he did, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And he saw this and he was so frustrated by it. And we actually have a letter that he wrote to a priest friend of his, a pagan priest friend of his. And he said this, he said, I don't know what to do. The Christians are multiplying. And do you know why they're multiplying? Nothing has contributed to the progress of the superstition of these Christians as their charity to strangers. The impious Galileans provide not only for their poor, but for ours as well. That was the reason he saw that the church continued to grow. Because at that point in time, you just took care of the ones like you. Romans took care of Romans. Greeks took care of Greeks. Jews took care of Jews. And what he's saying, the problem with the church is they take care of everybody. They are promiscuous with their generosity. You see, when you focus your efforts on remaining in the center instead of being on the margins, you will always curry to the powerful and the influential instead of to the margins where Jesus conducted all of his ministry. And in so doing, When you just, you remain in the center, in the place that's comfortable, in the place that you know, it can become so easy to develop a faith that is devoid of works. A faith that that just says to the one in need, just like James records, you know, I wish you well, do keep warm and be full, but then does nothing to help. 
Or maybe, maybe we want to translate it in a different way for us. Maybe we'll say, you know, I would give you money, but I'm afraid you'll just use it on booze or drugs. Or I would give you money, but then tomorrow you're going to be hungry again, so it's not really solving anything. Or I would help you, but I'm going to be honest, I'm just not comfortable now. That sort of faith, James says, that sort of faith that exists without any works, that faith is dead. He doesn't mince words at all. And the early church, they understood that. And so they lived out their faith with extravagant service. And why? Because they had inherited the legacy of the God who rescues, who liberates those in bondage and lifts up the poor and oppressed. They knew that God had rescued them from their old lives, liberated them from a slavery to sin, and all of the wheel spinning and cycles of dependence that can go along with that. They were a people who had experienced God's grace, and they knew that when you find something good, when you had been in bondage and now you know liberty and freedom, you don't keep that to yourself. They knew that when you walk by someone and bound in chains and you know the one who is the key, you don't keep that to yourself. And sometimes, yes, it can be so hard to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I say to you. And so maybe, maybe we try to help with a sheepish God bless. Or maybe we just start by giving, by giving what you have, but even more, giving that most valuable of your commodities, giving your time. Or how about forming relationships with people so that you are not the one at the position of power above, but instead can walk together as equals. And we do all of this because of God's great love for us. Now, some of you, if you're, if you're honest, you may be thinking, you know, I hear you talking about God's love, and I know there's talk of God's grace, but, but, but I don't feel that love. I don't feel inspiration, or I don't feel led to do it. And you know what? That's okay. We're allowed to be honest here. But to be even more honest, the part of the reason it's okay is because the beauty of Christian love is that it's never been dependent upon feelings anyway. I mean, let's think about Jesus when he was up there on that cross and had been pierced by nails and thorns and spears as he was being tortured by Roman centurions. Do you think he thought, I have warm fuzzies in my heart for these people right now? Or did his love become demonstrated by his actions? We are called to do the same. Faith and works, they seem to, well, for lack of a better term, they, they work together. One inspires the other, which then inspires the other one back again as they seamlessly work together back and forth. It's almost like the wheels of a bicycle. It's probably been a while since any of you have ridden an actual bicycle. Maybe you cycle some at the Y, but, but I want you to try an exercise the next time you're at the Y cycling, or just imagine it from your time when you rode bicycles. How well can you go up a hill if you're using just one foot? Just one. Crank. Go ahead, try to bring that pedal around again. Crank. You got to have both working together. And you know what that is? Faith and works and faith and works as faith empowers your works and then works empowers and boosts your faith. And you continue on and on again. The two need one another in order to function well. And pedaling with one foot is not going to take you very far. But with two feet, well, my friends, that is faith that moves. And as our faith is moving, guiding us out into this world, we might wonder, how much should we be doing? I think the answer for most of us, when we're wondering how many works do we need to be doing, most of us, I'm going to have this answer for you, just a little bit more. How much more should I do today? Just a little bit more than yesterday, just a little bit more kindness a little bit more grace, a little bit more love and action. Because as we do just a little bit more, you know what happens? We become a little bit more like Jesus and a little bit more like Jesus day and day and day as we pedal this and what happens as faith and works continue to move together a little bit more, a little bit more at a time. My friends, that 
is faith that moves. Amen.